pray that you bless this message tonight, Lord. I, I pray that we'd uh, just glean something from thy word and thank you for the promises that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you for uh, just life, breath, and health. And thank you for the church that we have. And uh, be with all the prayer requests. You know, there are many of them. I ask that you would you'd bless them, Lord, and answer them according to thy will. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Undoubtedly, this is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, especially when it comes to eternal security of the believer. Um, I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 as well. So let's get Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, one of the greatest verses in the Bible on eternal security, you can find in verse number 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So if we're just looking for verses for eternal security, this is undoubtedly probably the, the most popular verse in the Bible when it comes to eternal security of the believer. Now, of course, we believe in salvation by grace through faith. We don't believe that we have to help God out and try to work to obtain our salvation, but it's a free gift. The Bible says in Ephesians, if you go there to chapter 2, if it's some simple little verses, great verses in the Scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, and it says in verse number 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And Tony, to your point, what we have is the world. Uh, Tony gave testimony about some things and changes at work that he has to go through and just how the world is changing. But you can't put anything past what the world will do. You know, when we think that the depths of iniquity can't go any further, trust me, they can. And these are things like Tony was talking about, all these pronouns and nobody knowing what gender they are and calling people what they prefer to be called. And it's just, it's just, it's insanity is what it is. It's craziness. Uh, it's, it's demonic and it's, it's bringing, it's bringing iniquity down even further and further. And the dregs of iniquity are getting deeper and deeper and deeper to where man is just bottoming out when it comes to iniquity. And believe me, when you say, well, it can't get any worse, trust me, it can, because we don't know what the depths of iniquity can go to in society. But we know this, that God won't let it go too far. And we've seen that with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says that that stuff, Sodom and Gomorrah, remember Lot's wife, these were all things that were given to us as examples, examples, in other words, of how not to live, and behavior that God will not put up with in the end. Uh, but again, man thinks he's smart, and with man wanting to go the next step and become more like God, he's setting new rules and new laws that are outside of the realm of nature. And it's perverse, it's wicked. But remember this, we were on that side of the fence until the Lord saved us. And he did something to us that the world cannot know, that can't know. And you'll see that in Romans chapter 8. The world does not understand the way a Christian thinks because they can't understand it. They don't have the Spirit of God living in them. They're still dead in trespasses and sins. They're, they're bound in the sin that Adam and Eve committed. It rules them and reigns over them. They have no way out except through Christ. And the Bible says here in chapter 2, verse 1, and you hath he quickened, we're made alive. We're not dead anymore. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past, and this is, this is a great verse here. And again, Tony, this goes along with what you had said. And for the people on Zoom that didn't hear you, uh, Tony gave a testimony and talked about some changes at work and how it's just unbelievable 
it's like he was he was living in a different realm for a second saying this has to be a prank and it's not a prank it's it's happening all around the united states and it's it's a country that once believed the bible it's a country that once had righteousness and exhibited righteous behavior and it's a country that's given given themselves over to sin and and think about this in verse 2 and and this kind of nails it down wherein in time past ye walked how did we walk in time past according to the course of this world and there we go the course of the world who sets the course of the world who sets it like you say you wonder you say to yourself and i'm sure you did tony and i do too when i get involved in this stuff and i think who's doing this where's this coming from Whose idea is this? Well, it comes into the head of a man, the heart of a man or a woman or whomever, but where does it come from? Where is this ideology from? Who sets the course of the world? Wherein in time past ye walked, all of us did. Before we were saved, we walked after the course of the world. How? According to the course of this world, according to who? The prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's Satan. The prince of the power of the air. So above our head is air. And above our head is a prince that rules over the power of the air. And in that air are demonic forces. The Bible says that the devil is the god of this world. The god of this world. There are principalities. There are powers. There are rulers of darkness. And there is another thing, and that is spiritual wickedness. Where? In high places. In high places. You know, in the Bible, when they sought out the high places, my wife and I always talk about this, and she say, that king was righteous. However, that king never removed the high places. They left the high places. There were things being done in the high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, when this is all said and done, thank God, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to throw down this stuff. He's going to throw down dominions. He's going to throw down every high thing that exalteth itself against God. The Lord will throw it all down. But in the meanwhile, we have to live here. And that's why we need to be prayerful. But we need to always remember where we came from. That we were once walking that way. We were once following the course of the world and walking after the prince of the power of the air. And it says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So God calls unsaved people, children of the world, children of disobedience, among whom also, look, it even goes further, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh. Okay? Okay. That's how we lived. And think about your life before Christ. It was about you, wasn't it? You lived for you. And you lived to please you. And that's why so many people get sick of that lifestyle. And oftentimes the devil will overplay his hand in a person's life and get them to the point where they say, what is life worth? And that's when the Lord comes in because they got their back against the wall or life has dealt them many blows and they realize that this is not happiness and they pine for that. They pine for happiness. They pine for peace. They pine for some kind of joy. And that's why people do drugs. That's why people get drunk. Somebody was asking me the other day, why do people drink so much? Why does the average person always have to have a bottle in their hand? Why do they always seek that everywhere they go? It's because deep down they have no peace. Because they don't know what peace is. 
and they think they have to tap into this stuff to get it. And in the end, it's a trick, isn't it? It's a trick. It's a trick. And they're just like a puppet on a string. And they follow the course of the world, and they follow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in. You see, in. That spirit is in them. It works in them. And that's why all of us should say amen when we think about the transition. What we were and where we are. Now, sometimes with young people that get saved at a very young age, you don't realize what life could have been because you're faithful to God. But you don't realize what the Lord potentially saved you from becoming. And trust me, in this world, you don't ever want to find out. Because we could get many that have gone through all that I said. And some even in this church could get up and say, let me give you a testimony about my life. And understand I had, and they may say this, and we've heard this from our mission, a lot of missionaries, haven't we? I had no power over it. That's the one thing that I noticed when I went to Pensacola. When I was sitting in the Bible school with my fellow students, I looked around the room and I saw a lot of rough characters. And when they got up to preach, many of them would preach with tears in their eyes and they would say, if you knew me before I got saved and knew where I was and knew what I was, you would not have liked me. And how many of them I watched get up or preach and cry and say, what God saved me from, you will never know. Because they followed the course of this world, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And again, no matter how much you might think, well, I was saved when I was a kid and I've lived a pretty clean life. Amen. Amen. And if you can say that, amen. But remember, we still came from a sinful nature. And the Bible specific here, that's why I like Ephesians 2, where it says in verse 3 again, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Not only children of disobedience, but children of wrath. That's why when people say, well, God loves everybody. Yeah, well, he did show his love on the cross, but yet the Bible says <clears throat> that God is angry. Can anybody... Give me the rest of the verse. God is angry, and listen to this. God is angry with the wicked every day. He's angry with them every day. But then one might say, if he's so angry with them every day, then why does he let them do it? Because he is so full of compassion and mercy, and he's long-suffering. Think about what he lets us get away with. It says, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But, but God, in fact, this goes along with my, my reading. I, this is crazy because I wasn't even going to go here tonight. But I read something the other day. It was a study on the two words, but God. And I tell you what, if you want a good study or a good message, and one day I'm going to have to, I don't know how I'll look this up in the concordance, because I'll do it and I'll get 4,000 references, and then I'll have to try to whittle this down. But you take two words, but God. And in this case, we look and we say, okay, let's take those two words, 
but God. Now here we got the transition, okay? But God, who is what? Rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. So it's this. We were this, but the Lord came to the rescue. But God, it says in verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. And, and that should show us all that we need to know about salvation, because how can a child of disobedience, how can a child of wrath, how can a child of the prince of the power of the air, how can that person work themselves out of this position? And the answer is they can't. What work are you going to do that's going to make you holy? You say, well, I'll sweep my heart out and I'll get rid of the devils within me. Didn't somebody try that in the Bible? And what happened? He said, okay, I'll leave for a little while and I'll look for another house. He said, uh, I, I can't find one like the one I used to be in. And I'll tell you, I, I'm going to go back. And with that, he brings seven more spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter into the man. And the Bible says the last state of the man is worse than the first. What will self-reformation do for you? Oh, the world loves that, self-reformation. Like I talked about last week, self-compassion. Self-reformation, self, 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 self. It doesn't work. You want to be reformed? And anybody listening to this in the future, you want to be reformed? Drop self. Done with self. I'm going to God. That's where reformation comes. But God, what can he offer us? Oh, peace. How's that? Peace in a world that has none. Comfort in a world where it's not very comforting. Rest in a world of unrest. While everything is turbulent around you, a Christian has peace. Peace, because God gave that to us. It says in verse 6, and hath raised us up. To where? And hath raised us up. How far? Well, not just because we were bowed over, uh, bound in sin and bowed over like this. God raised us up. Well, he didn't just raise us up that way. God raised us up way beyond this earth. So that we actually tonight sit in heaven. We sit in heaven. You say that. I, yeah. Yeah. I understand that one. Tony, you're sitting here tonight. Bill, you're sitting here tonight. Tommy, you're sitting here tonight. Kathy, you're sitting here tonight. Annette, you're sitting here tonight. The Lord says, well, you say, well, I'm in church. You're where you're supposed to be, amen? <clears throat> but you're sitting way beyond that. The Lord says, uh, Annette, you're not just sitting here in church. You're right up here. Amen. Right up there. How can we sit there? How? Spiritually, we're like, who remembers Rex Harrison? Remember the song he sang? He sang, well, I'm already over on the other side, waiting on my brand new body. I'm sitting up there in the heavenly fair on the right side of the Father. My citizenship's in heaven. I'm living in Christ, you see. Well, I'm already there in Jesus. I'm waiting on my body to be. Who's ever heard that song? He's already there. He sang it. He said, does that go along with the Bible? Well, yeah. The Bible tells us this. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, you say, well, yeah, but I can fall from grace. You realize if, if the Lord would take away your salvation from you, he would have to pull you back down from heaven as well. You're sitting up there in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us 
through Christ Jesus. And look at this. For by grace are ye saved, through faith. Simple verses, but boy, how hard people have. You know, they just can't seem to get it. Well, I say to somebody, are you saved? And I've heard this more than oh, so many times. Are you saved? And I hear this from a lot of black people that I talk to. I don't know where they get it, but black men, for instance. I just, I've talked to a lot of say, are you saved? Well, I'm working on it. I'm like, wh why? What are you talking about? You're working on it. I'm working on it. No, stop the working. Get saved by grace through faith. It says simple, right? For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. He made us. His workmanship, created in, in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Well, I'm getting such a blessing out of this. I was only going to read a verse here, but I am, I don't know about you, but I'm getting a blessing out of this when I see just like, wow, what God has done for us and how Ephesians chapter two just lays this out. We were without hope. We were without God. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were some, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And how precious is that blood? For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You see, there was, before we were saved, what was between us and God. There was a wall, a wall. We couldn't get through there. But the Bible tells us in the book of Timothy, what's it say? There is one God. And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The wall that stood there, I, I, I think of this, I think of Christ with a sledgehammer. And when you come to him, you say, Jesus, can you get me to the Father? And he says, you see this sledgehammer? This has never failed. I can get you there. And he takes that sledgehammer and he hits that wall and he busts that wall down. And some people say, well, Thor's hammer is strong. A hammer in the hand of Christ, one God and one mediator. You see, the father might have an outstretched arm to us, outstretched hand, but because of the wall, there's no way to put our hand in his. There was a wall between us. The Bible talks of the word enmity. Enmity. There was enmity between God and man. But Christ was able to restore the peace. Now he did one of these. He took our hand and his father's hand and he put it together. He is our peace. And he broke down the wall so that we could put our hand together with the Lord. And become one with him. And boy, the promises that, that come with that. He broke down the wall between us. Now, the question is, do we have it for eternity? Well, there are a lot of people today. I remember when I was in Florida, we had a Mennonite preacher come in, and he talked to us, and he tried to convince us all that we could lose our salvation. I mean, why would you do that? You're, you're not eternally secure. You can lose it. If you sin willfully, you'll lose it. I heard him say it with my own mouth, and I thought, wow, I'm hearing this. Really, I've heard people say, well, you know, 
they believe you can lose your salvation or they believe you can lose your salvation. But I'm hearing it right here from this preacher, and he's telling us that we could lose our salvation. Well, immediately in my mind came the greatest chapter in the Bible on not losing your salvation. Let me ask this. Do you ever get discouraged? Do you ever get troubled? Do you ever feel like sometimes, oh man, I, I'm just frustrated with life? You ever feel like sometimes the devil's got you by the throat down like this and you're just like, man, I, I just want to give up. Is it then that you've lost your salvation because you feel that way? Do we base our salvation on feeling? Or do we base it on fact? And really, when you think about it, what can separate you from God's love? What can? I think Paul was pretty clear when we go to Romans chapter 8. I think he's pretty clear. I mean, I don't know what else he's got to put in there. But if you go to Rome, this should, if you're discouraged tonight at all, this should pick you up. It should really pick you up. You know, sometimes we just have a Romans chapter 8 day. And if you ever get one of those, you say, I just need to get to Romans chapter 8. And you say, well, Pastor, what's Romans chapter 8 about? Well, let's go there. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> now, let's look at one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Uh, and, you know, Romans is just such a powerful book. <clears throat> Thank God for Romans. And it says, and it starts off with chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. <clears throat> for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, again, as a Christian, you can be carnally minded. When we say someone is carnal, when Paul told the Corinthians, ye are carnal, that meant that they were walking after the flesh. And if you read First and Second Corinthians, you'll see a difference in the two books. In First Corinthians, Paul's rebuking them quite a bit. And you get the second Corinthians and it's a change of heart because it seems from his first letter that he wrote to him that they got the message and they got right with the Lord, especially one particular individual who Paul in first Corinthians says to pray to Satan, pray, pray him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And even there, he says, this person's committing such wickedness. And he was, the Bible says that he should have his his own, his father's wife, okay? So this man committed fornication with his stepmother. And Paul said, that's pretty wicked. And you've not, you've not mourned over this. You've not, you've not been upset about this, but you've rather kind of let this thing go. And he, he really gets on them in first Corinthians. And he says to them, instead of, instead of doing what you're supposed to, you're supposed to be praying this person's to the, to Satan. I mean, imagine church turn around and say, we pray this person to Satan. That's what Paul said. And he, he really gets on him in first Corinthians and the, the message, they get loud and clear and you get the second Corinthians and it's a completely different thought. And in fact, Paul then later on talks about this particular individual and tells them to have grace with him because he gets right with the Lord. Praise God. But we have carnal Christians. And in the world we live today, it's pretty easy to get carnal because everything around us tries to suck us into the vortex of sin. You know, everywhere you turn, like brother, even going to work, 
what you said tonight. You're being faced with wickedness in the very job you have. It's like, why does that stuff have to even be part of what you do? Why does it have to be part of what we, how we live? But the devil's trying to force speed this stuff into the mouth of Christians. And everywhere we turn, it's around us. Carnality abounds, believe me. Christian church we have in the world today, the Christians, that we're laid to see us. The Lord says, you're neither cold nor hot, but you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You think you're clothed. You say you're rich. Say this, you say that. And he says about the Laodicean church, knowest not that thou art what? What's some of the things he says? And knowest not that thou art wretched. Wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I mean, those aren't good things. And he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tries, tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And then what's he say after that? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know, really, our country, our country needs a good rebuke. It needs a good rebuke by God. It really does. And Christians, again, Christians are just going along with it. Now, again, we're in the world. We walk in the world. And we can't help but rub elbows with people of the world. In the world, but we don't need to be of the world. Got to be careful. We're in the world, but we shouldn't be of the world. And remember this, no matter what happens around us, God sealed us. And there's nothing that we can do that would cause us to be separated from the love of God. Let's look a little further down the chapter. Let's go and look in verse number 28. <clears throat> this kind of starts it off here. Some of the greatest words ever penned. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate. And again, when you see the word predestinate, you don't always associate that with salvation. In fact, most of the time you don't. We weren't predestined to be saved. But when we got saved, we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So here it is. God said, and this is basically in a nutshell what it is. God said, whoever gets saved, whoever comes to me and receives me as their savior, I will do this for them. Okay. They'll be conformed to the image of my son. He already said that. So when a person comes to Christ to be saved, they weren't predestined for salvation. Once they get saved, now the Lord says, because you're saved, you are and were predestined to be what I said would happen when you got saved. So God said, whoever comes to my son, whoever gets saved, I'll predestine you. I'll already say this in advance. You'll be conformed to the image of my son. And tonight, if anybody listening to this says, can I get that? The Lord said it would happen if you got saved. He already predestined you to do it if you get in Christ. So once a person gets in Christ, what's he do? He makes you conformed to the image of his son. He said he would do that. That's what the predestination is. Okay. Let's go on. It says in verse number 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called and whom he called them. He also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <clears throat> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? All right, now, here it is. <clears throat> shall tribulation, and again, I think Paul covers things pretty well. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. He says, can anything separate you from the love of Christ? Any tribulation come in your life? That won't separate you. Any distress, despair, any type of depression? That won't separate you. Persecution? They can beat you to a pulp. That won't separate you. Famine? You could die of hunger or be on death's door due to hunger. That won't separate you. Nakedness, somebody could take all your clothes and cause you to have no, nowhere to go and put you out somewhere and you can't even clothe yourself. That can't separate you. Peril, sword, nope. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Covers a lot of ground, doesn't he? <laughs> nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how the love of God is so strong in our life. Once we get in, nothing can separate us. And not only that, but we're more than conquerors. So tonight, if something's got you down, if you feel a little bit in despair or a little bit in distress, or you're a little bit depressed, maybe over just life itself, or maybe the situation you're in right now, remember this, God's stronger than that situation. And God's love can pull you through it. And how many times has he already pulled you through? And you say, man, it was. Uh, and how many times we say it was only God who got me through that. If it weren't for the Lord, oh, that thing would have just sucked me down. But praise God, he got me through. Got me through. And that's the older I get. And I tell you this, I get up in the morning and I say, okay, Lord. We're going to do this together. Here's another day, and together we're going to tackle this. And I'll tell you, by the grace of God, you get through the day, and you get to the other side in the evening, and you look back and you say, I got through another day. By the grace of God. For when we are weak, he is strong. He is strong. He that glorieth, and I'll close with this. He that glorieth, come on. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Glory in the Lord. And I say, praise the Lord. Let all that hath breath, praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. What did I just quote from? Psalm 150 the way it ends. Let all that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. All right.